Once again, good morning, colleagues. We move on now to the presentation from the Department of Higher Education and Training. You will notice from your program that uh, we have Ms. Mandisa Kape is supposed to be presenting. Unfortunately, um, she's not able to come to the conference today due to circumstances beyond her control. But in her place, we have two of her colleagues who are coming up the stage, and they will co-present what they have. So, on my immediate left is Ms. Kundiswa Sotenjwa, who is the Director for Student Support at the Department of Higher Education and Training. And with her, on the extreme left, is Ms. Silendile Shabalala, who is Deputy Director for the University Capacity Development Program, which is a very important program at DHET. And they will co-present, and their topic is how DHET promotes and supports student success. So I will hand over the floor to, to the two colleagues. Between the two of you, if you can take 20 minutes for your presentation, and leave that at 10 minutes for questions. That would be great. James Doc, I'll take way less than 20 minutes. <coughs> Good morning. I am Sli Shamalala. And the first part of the presentation was supposed to be done by Mandy. So I'm sorry, I need to help. I can't, I can't be too short. The mic is student success and I think she chose this topic because we don't necessarily as a department implement student support services <coughs> but rather we, we give grants or draft policies so our presentation is just an overarching um, support that we give to universities as a department. The background it starts with the acknowledgement that Although successes have been made in terms of how the department has supported the system, a number of challenges still exist. And amongst those challenges are highlighted in the yellow, that among a variety of other challenges that the department will still need to deal with includes um, student success problems. Now, with that realization that a number of things still need to be done, the department came up with this program that our facilitator has said is a very important program. Uh, it's called the University Capacity Development Program. It has these four following um, um, objectives. Now these objectives cut across the three focus areas because we don't only focus on student support. We have curriculum development, we have staff development, and then we have student development. So I'm just going to quickly go through those um, four. The first objective of the UCDP is to grant access as well as high levels of success for all students, be it undergraduate or postgraduate students. So this objective is, is informed by <coughs> the fact that the department has realized that even though we have opened access, so a number of students are able to now access the higher education system, but there's still blockages in terms of how they succeed. And we equate success to um, timeliest completion of, of that degree, be it in record time or at least in the years of N plus one. And so because we have realized that there is a need to give that access and then support that they complete successfully, that is one of the main objectives of the UCDP. The second one is to create an academic pipeline that enables recruitment and develop adequate um, members of new academics, numbers of new academics. 
So this was informed by the realization that a number of the academics that are currently on the system are actually leaving the system, be it they are retiring or they are maybe going for other adventures. But there was there was not enough pool to recruit from from young academics, especially those coming from disadvantaged backgrounds. So as another objective is to then create that pipeline of young academics who could be recruited when the old ones are leaving the system. The third one is the provision of development opportunities for professional staff as well as um, university staff members in managerial positions in universities. So because one of the focus areas was staff development, we did not want to focus on just academic staff. And therefore, that objective strives to just, um, what's the word, where, where you let the pool. So the, the, the support that you give to staff is not only to academic staff, but you support professional staff. You support um, staff members that are in managerial positions in universities. The last one is the development or the renewal of academic programs and curricula that are of strategic importance and are aligned to national objectives or national priorities. This speaks to that third focal area of um, curriculum development. So the, the UCDP supports or gives grants to universities for curriculum development. We've heard a lot about um, of late the decolonization of the curriculum. So that objective speaks to those needs where we need our curriculum to reflect or at least be accommodated to how we learn. As, as a South African society. This is just a depiction, it's a graphic depiction of um, a holistic overview of what the UCDP does. So the three circles are our three main focal areas. We focus on student development, curriculum development, and staff development. And that canister that you see on your left represents the multiple resources that are used to oil these um, three wheels and we get, be it professional support or a financial support from those three that are listed at the left. It could be us as a department via our UCDP, could be universities themselves via their own contributions towards the UCDP, as well as civil society organization and other international partners. Right, I'm just gonna go till the end of this one, so that I explain it nicely in one go. Right, this is a depiction of how the department believes a structured approach or an integrated approach towards student support ought to look like. Now, we say ought to look like because we are not implementing this, we are just giving this as an overview of what institutions ought to do or what we believe institutions should do when it comes to an integrated approach or implementing an integrated approach when it comes to student support services. The first rectangle there that you see analyzing, predicting and, and planning from qualitative and quantitative data. So the expectation from the department is that <coughs> universities do collect this data, right? Because you, you get to the end where you are offering these programs post a collection of, of data. And that collection of data starts from this basic education system, so what you see there, the schooling system right there at the top. You collect that via matriculants who are applying to enter into the universities. So by the time you recruit or afford spaces or admit a certain student, you already know what, what background they're coming from, whether they're coming from a quintal one, two, or three um, um, schools. And you would know then if you have a number of students that you have recruited from the basic education system that come from previously disadvantaged backgrounds or disadvantaged schools, you already have an alert that you probably need to put into play more student support services because those students will come with that disadvantage. Then from that on, you move to the early warning systems. The early warning systems you, you make from 
that analyzing of, of data, because now you know this is the type of student that I have recruited, these are my first year cohort, and this is the type of support that they would need in place. And then you put those early warning systems, which will lead you to the relevant advising of the student. Once you have put these systems in place, you can have detection. Then you detect which student number one, two, and three might be needing some assistance because they might not be able to succeed in the system in record time. Then the student advising leads to the student support. So as you advise, you advise um, maybe the student needs psychosocial support, maybe they need academic support, maybe whatever support they need will lead into the next one where you are offering them their student support programs. The student support programs listed there in light blue are the ones that we picked up from the current cycle of UCDP plans from universities. They range from tutoring programs, mentoring programs, all of those. What I would want to maybe lift up from that, and I think with our engagement with the 26 universities, universities have actually agreed to this, that the current cycle plan, so the current cycle is from 2021 to 2023. A number of universities, almost all 26 universities, have student support programs for tutoring, mentoring, or any other kind of academic support. But a few of them have support in psychosocial, or mental wellness support. Um, so we are expecting another call will go out this year, I think in, a, in two months' time, for universities to submit new UCDP plans. So the expectation from the department is that with the new UCDP plans, which will commence from 2024 to 2026, we will see more student support gearing towards psychosocial or mental wellness um, programs. Then the end of all of this, it will be the evaluation and impact. And at the end, when you evaluate, our arrows are pointing back to the main programs that you were offering because as you evaluate the impact, it should fit into how you then go back and improve on the tutoring programs or you know, add more changes wherever you need those changes. And then all of this will lead to uh, student graduating and then finally participating in the economy. This is my last slide on the UCDP before I hand over to Ms. Sotendra. This is just an overall picture of how we implement the UCDP um, program. We implement them in these three different sub-programs. The first one there is an institutional grant sub-program. This is the main, and it takes up a huge chunk of our grant, UCDP grant. This is where we give um, grants to universities to run their individual programs as informed by their approved plans. And this is where we see mostly the student support services and student support um, activities occurring. That is in the institutional grant sub program. The second one is the university led collaborative program. This one, we haven't seen much of student support services, and I think maybe it's an opportunity for universities in the next call to take up this one, because in this sub program, universities come together, they collaborate, they have one university leading that program, and then they offer programs that um, will service the entire university's um, um, cycle, that collaboration, be it two or three, it could go up to 26 if they wanted to. So we have not seen as a department many student support programs taken up by universities in this second one. So it's an opportunity and the grant is managed by, it's led by University of Limpompo. So on a yearly basis we um, put out a, uh, a call for universities to collaborate on programs that will service um, equally all of those um, universities that will be collaborating in that specific program. The last one is the nationally led sub program, and this one basically supports the recruitment of new academics. We have the nurturing of emerging scholars here, where we are funding honors students who are getting into their masters. Um, then they have an internship in that specific university that had recruited them. We have the NGAP, the USDP, the FPP, as well as the Higher Education Leadership Management Program. So in this last one, the, the focus is mainly to academic support, so pro the programs that are geared towards um, supporting an academic. But the first
first two are the ones where universities can take advantage to submit programs for student support. The next slide I will give to Ms. Sotendra. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am going to briefly talk about the Student Leadership Capacity Development Program. Uh, the department acknowledges that student engagement contributes to the success of students. So this program is mainly meant to provide trainings to student representative councils as well as the South African Union of Students. It is by no means intended to duplicate what is being offered by universities in terms of induction of SRCs, but rather complements what is being done at universities and do it at high level, at national level. It empowers SRC with the skills and knowledge and provides an opportunity to SRCs to engage higher education stakeholders. What do we do when we give these trainings? Uh, we, we invite former student leaders to come and talk to SRCs that are coming to the offices. Um, issues that they talk about, they also include the experiences that they had and also talk to the new SRCs on how to navigate the SRC pathway, which is so difficult for some of the SRCs. And the role, okay, and also it, uh, as I said, it facilitates interaction and sharing of ideas amongst the current SRCs. We invite all SRCs and put them in one room and we give them the topics, which also, in those topics, they include topics on ethics, um, and negotiations, so they will share ideas and then there will be a facilitator. So we believe we are empowering them as leaders because when they go out there, they have to sit in structures of universities and negotiate. Next slide, please. As I said, it is intended to provide training to student representative councils and also the South African Union of Students, which is the umbrella body of students, which was established to ensure an accountable representation of students at national level. As the department, we recognize that we had to engage with student leaders, in particular the SRCs, but it becomes so difficult to engage with each and every SRC. Therefore, as uh, the SAUS, which is the South African Union of Students, provides that national platform for us to engage with. Uh, the content of the program, I must say, it is a collaborative effort and consulted effort. We do this in conjunction with SASA, which, which is the Association of Student Affairs Practitioners. Why? Because, as I mentioned, we don't want to duplicate what is done by the universities and therefore SASA provides and leads the content of these workshops. In the main, it also includes the understanding of the higher education policies. We give them a training or a talk on the national frame of higher education policies, which we believe it assists them when they engage at the universities because they will be engaging from informed position of policies. It, it, it is very demotivating when you are speaking to a student leader and you can see that you are speaking from someone who does not knowledge of policies and is just arguing from uh, the other platform, which is not informed <laughs> by policy. Uh, it focuses on university governance. We all understand that SRCs, they do participate in governance structures. And we believe that if we give them a talk or a training at a national level, and when they go to these structures, 
they are better equipped to participate. Uh, we all understand that our sector has been challenged by issues of safety and security and wellness. Uh, we have higher health, yes, but we believe that if when they come to office, we provide training on these issues at higher level. Amongst others, other things that we talk to them about is for them taking up the role of safety and security and, and assisting other students. We empower and build decisive leadership. That's what we believe. Uh, because uh, in some of the sessions that we give, we talk about ethical leadership. We talk about negotiation skills with someone that is from the other political party. How do you engage with someone who have different ideologies from yours without causing a conflict? And we also talk, in, talk to them about conflict management, which is key for any student leader. In the, by the way, we are not training them to use these skills whilst they are in the office. We also believe that when we equip them with some of the skills, like ethical leadership, like how do you engage with someone who has different views with, with yours without causing a conflict, they can take these skills and apply them even when they are no longer at the institu institutions of higher learning. That's the outcome. Uh, as I'm, I'm wrapping up, I mentioned that we are working collaboratively with SASA. We have developed, in fact, SASA has developed the student governance framework, which, as we all know, student governance has been challenging our sector. Therefore, the framework will be rolled out very soon. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Let's have any comments and questions. I see this one hand up here. Can you give them a mic? Maybe we should take more than one. Um, let's take two. There's another one. So let's take this yeah, first and then the gentleman next. I didn't know 
of other dream, and I would like to know when do you train the new SRCs? And uh, uh, let me leave there, you know I can talk, but thank you. Yes, maybe uh, she has asked more than one question. You probably can address those before we move on to the next one. Okay. Thanks, Doc. Um, <laughs> I'll be increasing the money. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's a valid question. So, to put, I can't go back to the presentation, but I'm just going to go through, I think it was the second slide or the third slide, where, where, where I had said, yeah. The, the support is for both, and I, for all undergraduate and postgraduate students. So, we have that recognition as the department that it is not only first years or undergraduate but it also has to inform the success of postgraduate students. Universities submit plans, right, to the department. So the, the, the money or the allocation that you as a university will have towards supporting undergraduate and supporting postgraduate students will be determined by you as the institution and not the department. So I would say now we are going to give a call for the next cycle plan. And if, if you are saying as an institution, I Shabalang, the University of Washabalan, need more funding for postgraduate students, that should be enshrined in the UCDP plan that you will submit to the department. And the department will definitely support that. Thank you. When do you train? the new SRCs. We collect data on SRC elections. Once we determine that all universities have gone to elections, we get lists of newly elected SRCs and then we convene the training for them. Last year, we had one in December 2022. Thank you very much. I'm sure your questions are well answered. The gentleman over there. Okay. <clears throat> hello, hello, everyone. Um, I, I want to ask about the SRC because I, uh, I'm a former student leader as well. I want to find out like what is it that is being done to support students who are in the SRC because many a times the students they take longer, you know, because of student activism, they take longer to complete their studies. Uh, I don't want to to make examples, you know, people's names are very expensive. <laughs> but there's, there's a famous student leader at Vets, you know, uh, who caused a lot of trouble to know this was one. So so I, I want to find out what, what what so the first question, what um, sort of uh, student support services that are offered to SRC students in particular? And secondly, um, what happens when it comes to those programs that the programs only seem to favor a certain political affiliation? Because, uh, you know, the SAMUS, SAMUS, some of the people who are leading SAMUS, they are not even students themselves. So what is the legitimacy of SAMUS? Thank you. very much. Uh, as I indicated, say, that the training that we are offered is not intended to duplicate what is done by universities. So we mainly focus on legislative uh, framework and on governance issues. We believe that universities also have extracurricular trainings at the institutions of, of higher learning. Therefore, we 
really do not venture into that area. The legitimacy of South. South is not supposed to represent uh, one party. And South is elected by, by students, the essences themselves, at their conference. Uh, I can share this that the current leadership of South or the term of office is ending soon and they will be going to elective conference in September. Uh, we believe that when the students are electing South into office, South members, uh, they make sure that South does not represent one party. That's our belief. And we, or if we hear those things, we constantly engage with South to say there is a belief out there that you are representing one party. You are not supposed to be. You are representatives of all students, irrespective of party political background. Thank you very much. I know there will be many more questions, but unfortunately time is not on our side. We need to pave way for the next session. Let's thank our two colleagues, Lindele and Felicia. You can interact with them. I'm sure they are around. You can interact with them during tea time. Thank you very much.